Good morning or afternoon to all of our attendees, and thank you very much for joining us. Today, we will be discussing the benefits and considerations of digital health technologies for healthcare providers, researchers, and patients, and provide real-world evidence of HexoSkin's remote respiratory monitoring capabilities. First on the agenda, we will be delving into the quiet revolution occurring in the respiratory health field, where we will highlight current gaps in disease management. I'll then briefly introduce mobile health technologies and elaborate on key considerations for remote monitoring programs. Of course, before lending the floor to our esteemed guests, I will provide an overview of some cutting edge features of the Hexoskin Connected Health Platform. At the end of the session, we will be taking questions, so please feel free to submit them using the Q&A box or the chat box below. Over the past decade or so, developed countries have noted an important decline in the prominence of communicable diseases towards a steady increase of non-communicable diseases, such as chronic respiratory disorders. In fact, the latter now encompass approximately 10% of all global disability adjusted life years. This shift from acute treatments to long-term disease management has exorbitantly increased costs and placed a strain on already limited healthcare resources. Today, the total costs associated to a single respiratory disease are estimated at almost $50 billion in the US and almost 300 billion euro in Europe. The prevalence of chronic respiratory conditions is also rising, whereby 65 million individuals are living with moderate to severe COPD, 100 million are living with sleep disordered breathing, and 335 million are living with asthma. Now with rising costs and limited resources, we have noted important gaps in respiratory disease management, notably in COPD, asthma, and lung cancer care. For example, important efforts must still be placed in reducing the incidence of exacerbations in COPD and asthma patients. Solutions must be proposed to closely monitor adverse effects and response to therapy of lung cancer patients. Even established solutions, such as rehabilitation programs for COPD patients, must be made more easily accessible. But in all cases, the current healthcare architecture cannot solely support the increasing demand for respiratory disease management in research. Recently, digital health technologies have been introduced to support our current healthcare programs by addressing some of the current gaps. Of note, they have been adapted for remote patient monitoring settings, continuous data collection purposes, and even used to ensure treatment compliance. For remote patient monitoring purposes, several key considerations have been acknowledged by HCPs, research teams, and patients. For HCPs and research teams, the benefits of implementing an RPM include better intervisit data, reduced healthcare costs, and optimize utilization of services. Nonetheless, an emphasis has been placed for technologies which can demonstrate data accuracy and reliability, ease of use, and cost effectiveness. For patients, the benefits of implementing an RPM include optimized self-management, greater awareness of their condition, improved clinical outcomes. But of importance, RPMs must be user-friendly, engaging, secure, and provide some sort of feedback. Hexoskin is the leading digital healthcare company which has acknowledged and incorporated these key considerations into their connected health platform. Hexoskin reliably collects an array of clinically validated cardiorespiratory and activity biometric endpoints in a secure, user-friendly platform. Our digital health architecture includes body-worn sensors, online and mobile applications, a cloud-based database, and a data analysis server. The Hexaskin garment itself is machine washable, breathable, comfortable, and collects real-world evidence in a non-invasive fashion. It collects continuous biometric data 
through a one lead ECG, which captures basic metrics such as heart rate and heart rate variability. Our respiratory sensors are based on rip band technology and they monitor breathing rate, tidal volume, minute ventilation, inspiration and expiration events. And our accelerometer accurately collects actigraphy measures, step count and cadence. These biometric garments are available in men, women and children's form in a vast array of sizes. Over the past few years, we've worked very closely with our clients to tailor our platform according to their and their patients' greatest needs and values. Our community has voiced their intent of monitoring concurrent research studies of various sizes. They wish to minimize any operational frictions, and they also request optimized tools for data collection purposes to ensure that the data is reliable and it can be contextualized when appropriate. In light of these insights, as well as from feedback from a recent patient and user experience study, we will be launching a novel clinical dashboard, left-hand image, and an update of our Hexaskin application, right-hand image, to provide our community with the tools they require to further their innovative efforts. Our platform is designed to bring flexibility and allow you to operate with the other platforms and advanced analytical tools. I'll be taking a short moment to highlight some of the valued features of our mobile application, which include the visualization of data. From the main home page, you can easily access the sensors on the bottom of the center screen, which allows you to view the cardiac activity as well as breathing tracings in real time. A second highlighted feature includes the contextualization of data a crucial feature when attempting to interpret your findings. This can be accessed through the prescribed activity, then by swiping down on the activity page and performing the annotation. Another important feature is the addition of surveys. The results are timestamped and can be further contextualized with the help of health data and annotations. We've also received requests to add entries from our other sensors. Users may now add the function of blood pressure, as well as body temperature, and other entries from our application. Should your research or clinical needs require the direct incorporation of additional sensors, this can also be completed in conjunction with our biomedical team. Now the Hexaskin Clinical Dashboard is a platform used for the synchronization and visualization of data. From this dashboard, you may also extract and use the data in whichever environment is most useful to you. As we're very excited for the launch of this new dashboard, we wanted to quickly share with you a first teaser of this platform. A full-scale launch of this dashboard is expected for early fall. Now for the purposes of this demo, we will be exploring the COPD study. On the study's main page, you are able to visualize the team members that have access to your study data. Should you wish to make a patient-wide study update, you may do so by selecting the Make Announcement option on the right. Below, researchers and providers are able to quickly compile reports to closely follow the clinical progression of each group. Individualized data is also accessible by selecting the top left subjects feature. The following excerpt is an overview of each subject included in the group. As ease of patient entry is really of utmost importance, we've also included a feature to minimize this pain point. Patients can be uploaded in batches through the import feature. However, should you wish to proceed with the individual inclusion of patients, you may do so by selecting the Add button. In addition to manually entering customized information for each patient, this feature also provides clinical and research teams with additional guidance should they hesitate on garment size selection. Individual patient information is accessible through the Access File option on the right-hand side. Key cardiorespiratory metrics are summarized and displayed so that you may be able to visualize and track individual progress over the course of the data collection period.
Data pertaining to manual entries may also be visualized over the course of the monitoring period. The option of individualized reports can also be accessed through the bottom setting. The survey depicted on the following slide is extracted from our current research project, which involves the home monitoring of patients affected by COVID-19 using the Hexaskin biometric garment. Now, this is a sample report that we have developed to surveil the evolution of patients' health condition. Patient information is presented at the top, followed by summary daily metrics. Graphs depicting key metrics are also provided, as well as in information from a study questionnaire. Manual entries may also be briefly viewed. The clinical or research surveys which are available on the mobile application can be modified or completed through this dashboard by selecting the survey option on the top left. As always, the design in mind is user-friendly. We've also optimized the patient record list. This setting will estimate the number of completed or missing records in order to provide clinical and research teams with an overview of patient compliance and provide thorough details on the performance of an individual subject for a given prescribed activity. Once selected, summary metrics are provided to give an overview of the patient summary metrics. We can view the processed heart rate data, breathing data, minute ventilation activity, as well as cadence, but you also have access to the raw tracings for the ECG, the two respiratory bands, as well as the acceleration. Contextual information in the format of annotations are also flagged below the record. Completed or prescribed activities are on, found on the right-hand side. As well, we also provide multiple data download formats so that the information can be exported and further analyzed on various other platforms. This concludes some of the more exciting features, which will be shortly introduced in the fall of this year. For further information, please feel free to reach out to our study team to acquire further information. We pride ourselves in having a thorough list of independent researchers who have significantly contributed to our applications in the field, notably in the cardiac, respiratory, and activity fields, with also a prominent presence in the stress first responders and sports fields as well. I invite you to consult our Hexaskin page in order to access the Hexaskin white papers as well. Now, without further ado, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce our first lecturer, Denise Many. Denise received her Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science degrees in Technical Medicine from the University of 20 in 2013 and 2017. She is currently pursuing a PhD degree in medicine at the Hadboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. She has been a junior researcher at the Hadboud University Medical Center since 2017, and her research interests include lung physiology, the development of home monitoring devices, and improvement of patient care. As Denise was unable to participate in this live segment of the webinar, she has kindly recorded her presentation for your viewing. Any questions stemming from her presentation will be directed to her team immediately after the webinar. Hi, my name is Denise Manet, and I'm a technical physician. I'm currently working at the Department of Pulmonary Disease in the Radboud UMC, the Netherlands, to obtain my PhD degree. The focus of my research is to use new smart techniques in telemonitoring of patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Today, I want to discuss our latest research on the accuracy of spirometer calibrated lung volumes measured with the Hexoskin shirt. Due to COVID-19, we had to interrupt our research with patients, and therefore I can only discuss the outcomes of the Healthy Subjects study. Today, I will provide you with some background information on our research. I will briefly discuss chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, telemonitoring in the pulmonary field, and the goals which were set for our study. Then I will proceed with the methods and results and finish with a discussion.
chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is an irreversible and incurable lung disease that impairs normal breathing through various physiological mechanisms. COPD can be roughly divided into two components, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. The first is characterized by inflammation of the airways and excess mucus production, whereas in the latter, patients present themselves with alveolar damage. The course of this disease is characterized by normal day-to-day -day variations in symptoms, as well as by exacerbations, which are subacute increases in respiratory symptoms beyond these normal variations. These exacerbations may warrant changes in regular therapy and sometimes hospitalization is necessary. Telemonitoring has become a hot topic in the pulmonary field. Both Cruz and Ambrosino et al. describe the positive effects of telemonitoring on pulmonary disease. For instance, home-based management programs based on spirometry in patients with COPD reduces the number of hospital admissions and mortality, and therefore health costs. Moreover, comfort at home and quality of life can be increased for patients. In other reviews, more varying results are presented. Variations in effectiveness of telemonitoring could be the results of the method of measurement. At present, measurements at home often in only include subjective measurement of the symptoms. Moreover, only a restricted number of objective parameters, such as FAV1, are measured. And lastly, the measurements are only performed once a day. Patient outcomes could be improved further by measuring additional parameters, more objective and continuously. The hexascan seems a feasible method to include objective and continuous measurements in telemonitoring systems. In this study, we recruited healthy subjects who performed multiple tasks, including various positions and activities. While tidal volume was being measured with a spirometer and the smart shirt. The hexoskin is calibrated with use of the spirometer. Our main goal is to determine what the accuracy is of the calibrated hexoskin shirt to measure tidal vo volume in comparison to the spirometer. During monitoring um, at home, patients should also be able to remove the shirt uh, during, for example, showering or sleeping. And therefore, as a secondary goal, we investigated if the calibration determined in one session can be reapplied after removal and reapplication of the shirt. 15 healthy subjects between the age of 18 and 80 were recruited at the University of Twente in Enschede, the Netherlands. Subjects were excluded whenever they were not able to perform the tests, fit in one of the available shirt sizes, or had a pacemaker or ICD. All subjects gave written informed consent prior to participation. All subjects wore the shirt for a minimum of five minutes before starting with the measurements to get used to the shirt. Moreover, they had to wear a mobile ergo spirometer system with a flow sensor. After the five minutes of warming up, they performed two sessions of measurements. At the end of a session, all equipment was removed, including the shirt. Within an hour, all equipment was reattached and the whole session was repeated. During a session, the measurements contained seven tasks of daily living, containing five minutes of laying, sitting, standing, bend sitting, vacuum cleaning, walking with weights, and stairs climbing. As discussed, we recorded the respiration during the measurement with the hexoskin, as displayed in the left figure, and a calibrated flow sensor of the Oxycon mobile spirometer, as displayed in the right figure. Per task and subject, we determined the calibration factors based on the results of the spirometer, resulting in 15 sets of seven position-specific calibration factors.
we use the least square calibration method to get the calibration factors and determined factor A and B to match a tidal volume measured with the hexoskin to tidal volume measured with the spirometer. In the figure on the right, an example of the data is presented. In the upper figure, we can see the yellow and orange line representing the uncalibrated thoracic and abdominal signals, while the blue line indicates the summed signals. All signals are uncalibrated. In the lower figure, we can see that factors A and B are determined and applied to the data of the hexoskin, which is presented as the purple line. This closely follows the green line, which is the signal of the measurement with the flow sensor of the spirometer. Plant Altman analysis was used to determine the agreement between tidal volume measured with the hexoskin and the Oxycon mobile. The difference, diff TV, between both methods was represented as a percentage of TVOM, the Oxycon mobile, per task, and in each individual, a bias and limits of agreement were derived, and the mean or median bias and limits of agreement over all subjects was taken per task. A priori, we determined the bias had to be below 5% and the limits of agreements had to be within 15% to have a good agreement between both methods. As said, we used blunt altman analysis to calculate the bias and limits of agreement comparing tidal volume measured with the spirometer and the hexoskin in each session. In this figure, an example of one task performed by one subject is given. On the x-axis, we can find the mean tidal volume as measured by hexoskin and the spirometer. On the y-axis, the difference between spirometer and hexoskin tidal volumes is displayed. All points in the graph represent a tidal volume. In this case, we found a bias of close to zero and limits of agreement of 5.5%. In this table, the median bias and limits of agreement are displayed per task. Median bias was taken over all subjects. All outcomes are displayed in percentage, and on average, 1% equals 12 milliliters. A positive number indicates that the spirometer displayed a larger tidal volume than the hexoskin. The numbers in red do not meet the set accuracy criteria. In the tasks laying, sitting, and bent sitting, we found a median bias of 0%. The largest median bias was found in the task vacuum cleaning, which showed a median bias of minus 3%. This means that the hexoskin displays a tidal volume approximately 40 milliliters larger than the spirometer. In this task, the limits of agreement were 17%, which are outside of the accuracy criteria. In this study, we determined the accuracy of the calibrated hexoskin shirt to measure tidal volume in comparison to a spirometer in various tasks of daily living. In all tasks, accuracy of the hexoskin shirt was good, with biases below 5% and acceptable limits of agreement. More demanding tasks showed a slightly decreased agreement between methods. The increase in limits of agreement from inactivity to more demanding tasks can be explained by the increase in variation in breathing pattern or by the increase in movement artifacts. In the vacuuming task, we saw limits of agreement larger than 15%. It is hypothesized that the involvement of the upper part of the body in the task increased the artifacts to such an extent that the output of the hexoskin shirt was considered to be non-accurate. Based on the outcomes of this study, we can say that the hexoskin is a feasible method to be used for home monitoring of tidal volume. We determined the shirt to be accurate. However, the interpretation of the outcome of accuracy differs between studies and is dependent on the a priori rules.
The limits of agreement found in this study suggest the tidal volume measured with the hexoskin could deviate from the spirometric value by 15%. However, these outliers will not have a significant impact on the average measured tidal volume over a longer period, as is the case in home monitoring. The results in the second session suggest that we should recalibrate in a new measurement. However, based on the fact that there is a systematic fault, it would be possible to measure relative changes in tidal volume in a repeated measurement. Moreover, we should keep in mind that the results of the present study were based on healthy subjects. After the COVID-19 period, we are going to start the measurements with COPD patients. On the current slide, a list of used references can be found. Thank you all for your attention. That concludes Denise's presentation, and now it is my utmost pleasure to welcome our second guest speaker, Dr. Dennis Jensen, Associate Professor of the Department of Kinesiology and Physical Education at McGill University. He is a Tier 1 CIHR Canada Research Chair in Clinical Exercise and Respiratory Physiology and Director of McGill University's Research Center for Physical Activity and Health. He completed his Bachelor's of Science in Physical and Health Education at Brock University, his Master's and PhD in Exercise Physiology at Queen's University, and his postdoctoral research fellowship was in Clinical Exercise and Respiratory Pathology, Pathophysiology at Kingston General Hospital in conjunction with Queen's University. His research is focused on the mechanisms, measurements, and management of physical activity-related breathlessness and exercise intolerance in adults with chronic pulmonary disorders. Dr. Jensen, thank you very much for joining us today. And I would now like to announce that the floor is now yours. So thank you very much um, for this opportunity to present. Um, and a uh, nice segue from the previous speaker's presentation, um, providing some context about COPD and uh, the impressive work that they completed. Um, I will uh, give a slightly different approach um, looking at COPD um, and, and some of the, the ability of Hexoskin to, to monitor dynamic changes in ventilatory breathing pattern and in particular dynamic operating lung volumes during exercise uh, in this clinical population. So briefly, um, you've been explained what COPD is. A mix of emphysema and bronchitis is a very heterogeneous disorder with many uh, pulmonary and extrapulmonary manifestations, but I think to anchor the importance um, is to look at the prevalence of COPD in the general population. So this is some work done about a decade ago um, in Canada, looking at a population-based uh, evaluation of people with COPD, um, and what they identified was that, uh, that about 7% of Canadian adults uh, from across Canada um, self-identified as having a physician diagnosis of COPD. So that's the, the box there in, in green. Um, but when these individuals sampled from the general population off uh, random digit dialing, were brought into the laboratory and given post bronchodilator spirometry testing to diagnose chronic um, uh, partially irreversible airflow obstruction, you can see that that number rose to about 17%. So this basically indicates that about one in five adults um, in Canada have at least mild airflow obstruction consistent with the diagnosis of COPD. And what's most uh, uh, kind of maybe disconcerting or, or um, um, interesting is that is the 10% difference between the self-reported uh, prevalence of COPD and the, the objective assessment of COPD. And so in other words, there are many people that are walking around um, our communities that have an underlying lung condition, uh, it may be in the mild and relatively asymptomatic stage, um, but that just aren't aware. Um, they might be modifying their activity to avoid symptoms related to this particular uh, chronic condition. And as a consequence, um, you know, they delay care. Um, and so you can imagine that, that opportunities for remote uh, monitoring um, of respiratory rate variabilities, ventilatory variability uh, parameters, as well as lung volumes, might lead to early identification of, of people with heart, uh, lung conditions rather. 
And again, if you look across the stages of disease, you can see that the majority of people with a diagnosis of COPD are in the more mild, so global obstructive lung disease stage one or moderate um, disease. So really uh, the majority of people kind of fall in the more mild to moderate and asymptomatic phase of this disease. So it's a prevalent disease um, that affects many people. And to provide some context for this talk, um, I, I thought that it was important to first consider what the normal respiratory response to exercise looks like in health, what it looks like in COPD, and then to see whether or not in our study we were able to detect these pathophysiological abnormalities um, in breathing pattern. So here I'm showing you a typical spirogram uh, where a person takes a big breath in to total lung capacity. They blow all the air out to their lungs are completely empty. So that's their, from when their lungs are full to empty. That's the vital capacity. And then they go to tidal breathing um, where they breathe in and out. So the EILV is the end inspiratory lung volume. The EELV is the end expiratory lung volume. The difference between those two volumes is the tidal volume. And at the end of a normal breath out, you can ask somebody to take a big breath into their lungs are completely full. And the volume um, that that represents is what we call the inspiratory capacity. The mathematical difference between the inspiratory capacity and somebody's tidal volume is their inspiratory reserve volume. And so what happens is that at the onset of exercise in healthy adults without chronic airflow obstruction is that there is typically a recruitment of both the inspiratory and expiratory muscles um, that result in an increased uh, respired volume. So we get an expansion of tidal volume and this tidal volume in a healthy normal subject occurs by dynamically decreasing the end expiratory lung volume from the resting value. So the end expiratory lung volume will move into the expiratory reserve volume and the end inspiratory lung volume will uh, increase into the inspiratory reserve volume. So tidal volume will expand and only until the limits of exercise tolerance really where breathing become more uh, rapid and shallow to accommodate the increased ventilatory demands. But in, in most people, healthy adults, the respiratory system is not a factor limiting exercise. And even if they were able to achieve higher metabolic rates or demands, um, they would still generally be able to accommodate um, increased ventilatory requirements in terms of tidal volume expansion and ventilation. But this circumstance, is, uh, this situation is very, very different in people with COPD. So here's a similar spirogram, but for somebody with COPD, where you can see that their residual volume, so the amount of basically um, wasted ventilation or, or dead ventilation in their lung is elevated. Um, they have elevated total lung capacities, um, so they hyperinflate their lungs and they get these hyperexpanded rib cages. But because of pulmonary gas trapping, they actually lose volume. So their vital capacity is often reduced, and certainly their inspiratory capacity and inspiratory reserve volumes at rest are reduced due to this rise in the residual volume as well as in the expiratory reserve volume, um, the end expiratory lung volume or the functional residual capacity. And so in contrast to healthy adults, um, people with COPD at the onset of exercise will actually dynamically hyperinflate. So instead of their end expiratory lung volume decreasing in the rest to exercise transition, it will rise. And this temporary um, rise in end expiratory lung volume above resting levels will result in a, a pretty immediate constraint on tidal volume expansion, where um, with the erosion of the inspiratory reserve volume, um, people, dynamic lung hyperinflation mechanically constrains tidal volume expansion during exercise. And this mechanical constraint results in pretty pronounced symptoms of breathlessness and um, leads to people stopping exercise really very early. So you can appreciate that the ability to assess changes in operating lung volumes from a mechanistic perspective to identify why people have disproportionately high symptoms of breathlessness, maybe why they're avoiding or foregoing participating in activities or identifying the activities that um, you know, really make them breathless or uncomfortable um, would be a value to be able to track and monitor these volumes. Of course, the ability to assess these volumes um, in, you know, in, in therapeutic interventions clinically or through research um, in the daily life and outside of the lab would be a huge value to um, industry partners as well that are looking at 
the efficacy of their interventions for pharmacologic lung volume reduction. And so some of the consequences of this lung hyperinflation, in the upper left corner, I'm showing you the inspiratory capacity um, plotted against exercise-induced changes in ventilation on a bicycle um, in four groups of individuals. So here we're looking at people with Q1. So these are quartiles of people with mild, moderate, severe, and very severe airflow obstruction. And what you can appreciate is that people with more mild airflow obstruction have higher resting or inspiratory capacity, so they have more room to breathe at rest um, than people with very severe airflow obstruction. And all four of these groups dynamically hyperinflate. So with exercise-induced increases in ventilation, the inspiratory capacity progressively falls with exercise. And the slope of these relationships are really relatively similar, but perhaps a little bit more pronounced in people with very severe disease. But the implications of this are pretty dramatic in terms of um, the way that the constraints on ventilation and how symptomatic an individual becomes. So in the upper right corner, you can see that as the inspiratory capacity falls, going from mild to moderate, moderate to severe, and severe to very severe disease, you can see that the constraints imposed on tidal volume expansion um, are much higher. So at any given standardized submaximal exercise ventilation, a person with very severe COPD has much greater restrictive constraints on their tidal volume expansion than somebody with mild COPD. And as a result, they reach a critical limit to their ability to expand tidal volume at much lower levels of ventilation. So you can see that in the person um, in these Q4 very severe COPD patients, they reach a volume constraint at about 75% um, of their uh, inspiratory capacity. They, at about a similar percentage, but in Q1, this occurs at a ventilation on average of about 40 to 45 liters a minute. So the inspiratory capacity at rest and its evolution or decrease during exercise basically dictates the level of ventilation at which somebody becomes mechanically constrained and can no longer exercise. And it also dictates the evolution of the primary symptom of this patient population, which is, which is dyspnea or breathlessness. And so again, you can see in this beautiful fan of lines in the bottom left panel that in people with very severe COPD is that they reach their tolerable limit of breathlessness, in this case of breathlessness or dyspnea intensity rating of seven, at levels of ventilation just about 30 liters a minute. Whereas in the more mild disease, you can see that they can reach higher levels of ventilation before they reach that similar intolerable limit of breathlessness about a Borg rating of seven. But what's very interesting is in the bottom right panel, you can see that the evolution of breathlessness relative to the volume constraints imposed by the declining inspiratory capacity are actually superimposed. So the take home message here is that if, you have a, a, if you're able to measure somebody's inspiratory capacity and inspiratory reserve volume and the evolution with exercise, you can gain a much deeper appreciation for the mechanical mechanisms or determinants of breathlessness and somebody's exercise intolerance. Where somebody with a, a, a very small inspiratory reserve volume or inspiratory capacity will be more breathless at a given level of ventilation than somebody with bigger inspiratory reserve volumes and inspiratory capacities. And just measuring breathing pattern and ventilation alone does not give you insight into this very critical uh, patient-oriented information that might help guide therapy. And just to put this into context, if you look at the ability um, of these patients to tolerate exercise, again, going from mild to very severe in the left to the right, these are patients exercising on a cycle ergometer at 75% of their peak um, cycle power output, and you can appreciate that at the same relative exercise intensity, there is a disease-related deterioration in exercise endurance. And this is commensurate um, with the um, early onset of intolerable breathlessness. So in other words, people that become very short of breath very early stop exercise prematurely. So with that as a background, we really wanted to um, look at, validate, and assess the responsiveness of the Hexoskin Smart um, Garment to monitor ventilatory parameters during exercise in people with COPD. 
And so to this end, we studied 14 adults with COPD, 10 men and four women, um, about 72 years of age on average, uh, with an FEV1 of 69% predicted. Um, and we did simultaneous measurements of vent ventilatory parameters using the hexoskin, um, as well as a, a flow sensor during a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And for measurements uh, to assess validity and responsiveness to bicycle exercise, we had 34 simultaneous assessments um, in these patients. We had 13 incremental bicycle exercise test assessments done prior to participating in an eight to 10 week pulmonary rehab program. We also had 13 constant work rate exercise tests prior to rehab um, done at 75% of each individual's peak power output. And then we had eight paired measurements done at a second constant work rate exercise test done after um, an eight to 10 week outpatient pulmonary rehab program. And of these post rehab program constant work tests, we had seven individuals that completed both pre and post rehab programs for us to assess intra individual or within subject changes in ventilatory breathing pattern and operating volume parameters. So we're not only looking at the validity and the responsiveness to an exercise stress, we were looking at the responsiveness of hexoskin to detect physiological adaptations and ventilatory parameters following uh, eight to 10 week rehabilitative exercise training program. And so here what I'm showing you is a raw trace uh, from an individual subject that just kind of depicts um, an exercise test. So here we have about six minutes of quiet resting breathing. And what I'm showing you um, are the data extracted from Hexoskin and entered into uh, uh, an, an analytic software called Vivo Sensor, Vivo Noetics, which allows us to assess the respiratory um, uh, parameters. And so about six minutes of monitoring at rest, um, you can see um, in this case here, we have the end expiratory lung volume and the end inspiratory lung volumes monitored breath by breath. And what you can see is that we, at the, in the last three minutes, once every minute in the last three minutes of rest, we ask people to do a maximum voluntary inspiratory capacity maneuver. And so these maneuvers allow us to assess changes in end expiratory lung volume, as well as end inspiratory lung volume, based on the assumption that total lung capacity does not change in the rest to exercise transition. And so this is very important because if total lung capacity doesn't change, which we know from earlier studies, it, it's, it doesn't in COPD and health, then it really becomes an anchor point for us to assess changes in lung volumes um, over time or continuously um, you know, in the home environment outside of the lab. Here we have uh, the start of exercise and during exercise, you can see also that we did serial inspiratory capacity maneuvers. And what you can appreciate in this subject, um, this representative subject, well, first, is that when we actually assessed the um, inspiratory, when we sought to identify how many of the inspiratory capacity maneuvers could be detected when both the thoracic and abdominal bands were used to assess um, lung volumes or respired volumes, we found that only 47% of the 217 IC maneuvers done across the incremental pre and post uh, rehab constant work rate tests were reliably identified. And this was because of um, offsetting changes in abdominal and rib cage volumes. However, when we only limited our assessment to the thoracic band, we found that this number increased to 96% detection of IC maneuvers. So 209 of the total 217 maneuvers were identified and obviously confirmed with simultaneous um, assessments on a flow sensor, which would be the gold standard. So we focused our attention here on just the rib cage measurements without uh, including the abdominal measurements in our assessment. And so by excluding the abdominal respiration band from our analysis, we abandoned the idea of calibrating the respired um, volume signal using hexoskin in quantifying tidal volume expansion and ventilation in liters and liters per minute as units respectively. But while this could be perceived as a limitation, I actually think it's a strength because it really enabled us to assess the validity
rapidity and responsiveness of the Hexoskin smart garment in the way that we believe it's most likely to be used in the real world. Um, because practically speaking, end users um, do not have the ability to do a volumetric calibration of the smart garment um, prior to its use. And as you saw before, the calibration doesn't hold um, um, from day to day or within an individual or once the shirt is removed and put back on. Additionally, by excluding the abdominal respiration band, we were able to avoid making assumptions, which I think are very important, about thoracic and abdominal contributions to tidal breathing, which we know differ dramatically depending on factors like an individual's body size or their posture. So abdominal to rib cage contributions to tidal volume expansion are very different in the upright posture versus the supine posture. And lastly, studies that have used technologies like optoelectronic plethysmography, which basically looks at a 3D image of the rib cage, have found that the degree of lung hyperinflation during exercise and COPD tends to mainly report on changes in rib cage hyperinflation, which we felt further um, substantiated our decision to focus specifically on the rib cage. And if you even try to hyperinflate your lungs, you can find that you can maintain a pretty consistent abdominal volume, which um, would be measured with the abdominal band, but you really can't avoid um, hyperinflating your lugs, lungs and flaring your rib cage. So for these reasons, we felt that um, the rib cage was the, the best measurement to focus our attention on. And you can see in this example, certainly just that um, in the, after the onset of exercise, you can see a very early decline, um, increase in the end expiratory lung volume and an erosion of the inspiratory reserve volume with increasing tidal volume expansion and COPD. So even in this single example, um, I've shown you um, what, what really is the pathophysiological hallmark of COPD, which is dynamic hyperinflation. But of course, we need to quantify this. So something that I think is really important is in order for us to be able to use Hexoskin for remote continuous monitoring in the real world, we, and, and in the absence of, of doing volumetric calibration to a pneumatac or a flow sensor, we need to have an anchor point. So we need to know essentially that um, total lung capacity or maximum voluntary rib cage expansion is not changing with serial measures within a person over time. And so here what I'm showing you um, in the bottom left graph is I'm showing you the peak end inspiratory lung volume um, measured in arbitrary units or basically the voltage signal that was achieved with inspiratory capacity measurements performed at rest at a standardized inspiratory capacity maneuver during exercise and at peak during the incremental pre-rehab constant work rate test and post-rehab constant work rate test. And you can see if you go from left to right is that there's remarkable consistency in maximum voluntary rib cage expansion during these serial inspiratory capacity maneuvers within a given test and quite amazingly across tests. So if you compare the red values, uh, yellow and, and, and blue respectively across repeated measurements, you can see that there's very, very little systematic variability. And indeed, when we quantified the within subject um, trial to trial coefficient of variation, we found that the peak end inspiratory lung volume recorded from these serial inspiratory capacity maneuvers had within subject um, coefficients of variation that were far less than 1% on average. So in other words, when an individual takes a big breath into their lungs are full, Hexoskin is able to monitor that measurement very reliably serially over time. And I think this is a very important because it substantiates our view that total lung capacity is not changing. And it also gives us an anchor point to assess for changes in end expiratory lung volume and end inspiratory lung volume during exercise. If this, if this peak end inspiratory lung volume was wavering over time, we would have no idea truly what was happening to the behavior of operating lung volumes during exercise. So demonstration of this consistency was critical to our interpretation of the results. So here what I'm showing you um, are just the temporal patterns of the responses, focusing specifically on data collected from the post-rehab um, constant work rate test. 
Here I'm showing you uh, hexoskin measurements and ventilation. So these are arbitrary units per minute. So this is the hexoskin tidal volume measurement multiplied by hexoskin's breathing frequency. And of course, the metabolic cart measurement of ventilation in liters a minute. And you can see that the temporal pattern of the responses is virtually identical and they parallel one another, but obviously measured in different units. The exact same thing is true for tidal volume expansion. So from the rest to exercise transition, you can see the tidal volume expansion rises and then plateaus um, with, uh, um, with increasing exercise duration in COPD. You can see that on average, the VMAX and hexoskin respiratory rate um, are very, very similar with absolutely no differences, but the changes from rest and from each uh, uh, serial measurement time are very consistent between uh, the two devices, so the gold standard and the hexoskin device. And I think what's really, really novel here is that in addition, we demonstrated the ability that on average, we can detect exercise-induced changes in inspiratory capacity. So again, the inspiratory capacity measured in he with hexoskin in the upper part of the graph and with the VMAX or the flow sensor in the lower part. And you can see that in both tracings, um, there was a evidence of, of, on average, dynamic lung hyperinflation that was paralleled in the two devices. And importantly, when we look at the inspiratory reserve volume, which is really just the mathematical difference between the tidal volume and the inspiratory capacity, you can see that Hexoskin reliably detected exercise-induced reductions in inspiratory reserve volume um, in the rest and extra through exercise transition. So on average, hexoskin seems to have be a valid measure of detecting ventilatory parameters and their changes during exercise in people with COPD. And in particular is able to detect dynamic lung hyperinflation and uh, markers of dynamic restrictive constraints on tidal volume expansion as indicated here by the loss of inspiratory reserve volume. So when we also went in and we regressed, um, we wanted to see what was the slope of the relationships or what was the strength of the associations in each individual subject when we looked from rest through the submaximal and peak exercise responses um, of all of the ventilatory parameters, um, recognizing that people exercise to different levels. Um, for the paired measurements on the x-axis, in this case, an example of looking at the respiratory rate measured with the flow sensor on the y-axis looking at the respiratory rate measured with hexoskin. And when we looked at the correlation coefficients between the VMAX or the flow sensor and hexoskin for measuring ventilatory parameters, you can see that the, that the R squared values are remarkably high, indicating that the responses are very linear and the associations between paired measurements across data pooled for incremental constant work rate one and two tests are actually very strong. So in other words, the responses are linear and hexoskin um, appears to measure values um, uh, very comparably to what the VMAX or the flow sensor does, which is very reassuring. If we then what we did was we looked at, um, we pooled the data again, looking at the magnitude of the exercise induced change in measured parameters from rest to peak exercise. So we didn't think it was enough just to look at the strength of the association. We wanted to basically see whether or not people who had um, a very large uh, change in ventilation with exercise on the VMAX system or the metabolic cart were also those that had a very large change in ventilation or any other parameter on hexoskin. And here what we've done in, is pooled the responses, the rest to exercise induced change from the incremental test in the, in the triangles, the constant work rate test done pre-rehab in the circles, and the constant work rate test done post-rehab in the squares. And you can see that, the, that hexoskin and VMAX are really well correlated or associated to detect the magnitudes um, on re of change in respiratory parameters from rest to peak exercise. And this includes the changes, the absolute changes in inspiratory capacity and absolute reductions in inspiratory reserve volume. 
So again, it seems to be a very valid as well as uh, responsive test to detect exercise-induced changes in venatory parameters in this patient population. So then the next step was to see what was the ability of hexoskin to detect um, within subject changes in the venatory parameters during constant load exercise testing after eight weeks of participation in a outpatient um, exercise training program or pulmonary rehab. And here I'm showing you the correlation coefficients of the change in ventilation, tidal volume, respiratory rate, inspiratory capacity, and inspiratory reserve volume at three measurement, standardized measurement times during exercise done pre and post um, rehab. The highest equivalent exercise time in the second column, which is um, a standardized time completed by all participants across all trials. ISO time is a measurement that's standardized for each individual subject across pre and post rehab exercise tests. And the peak is uh, the symptom limited measure. And again, you can see that the correlation coefficients are really quite high and supportive of the idea that if the VMAX system uh, or the flow sensor detects um, an increase or decrease in ventilation, Hexoskin does as well. And this is despite the fact that obviously the shirt um, was removed and put on, not calibrated to a specific uh, measurement, but only to um, the uh, peak end inspiratory lung volume done on the uh, serial inspiratory capacity maneuvers. So again, very reassuring data here. And just to present this graphically, uh, here I'm showing you um, the, the changes, the rehab-induced changes um, for measurements per, uh, collected at peak exercise um, on the constant work rate exercise test in the upper left for um, the rehab-induced changes in ventilation with hexoskin on the y-axis and the flow sensor from the metabolic cart on the x, tidal volume in the upper middle panel, respiratory rate in the upper right panel, inspiratory capacity in the lower left panel and inspiratory reserve volume in the lower right panel. And again, you can see that these correlation coefficients are really quite strong. And importantly, while the sample size is small, you can see that um, if somebody had a decrease in their ventilation on the gold standard assessment with the metabolic cart, you can see that they also had a, a decrease with their ventilation on hexoskin. With really no people falling into um, uh, quadrants where there was a decrease in one system and, uh, and an increase in, in, say, hexoskin or vice versa. So appears to track um, rehab-induced changes really quite well. And so I've certainly taken up much of your time here, but I think the take-home messages that I have are that measures of maximum voluntary rib cage or thoracic expansion during these um, repeated inspiratory capacity maneuvers done with the hexoskin garment are highly repeatable within uh, uh, adults with COPD. And I think this is important because it mitigates the need for volume calibration because all measures can be anchored to an estimate of total lung capacity or basically they may be anchored to a zero volume. So this would allow for assessment of relative changes, not absolute changes in ventilation and breathing pattern on a, within a day or day to day within a given patient for continuous and remote monitoring. I think this also permits, uh, to that end, remote monitoring of operating volumes, provided that you can have the wearer perform inspiratory capacity maneuvers similarly regularly throughout the day. So maybe when they wake up, mid-morning, after, you know, afternoon, dinner, and before they go to bed. And you could then assess some, where somebody's spirogram is or where their breathing pattern occurs relative to their total lung capacity throughout the day, which I think is very important to understand somebody's symptom burden and their physical activity limitation, um, which you really can't get alone by just bringing somebody in acutely into the laboratory. Um, also, I think our data suggests that hexoskin is a valid and responsive tool for monitoring ventilatory parameters during exercise in this patient population. And we've also provided some evidence that it's responsive for detecting exercise training induced changes in ventilatory parameters uh, in this population as well. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Jensen, for joining us today and for delivering such an insightful talk. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our attendees for participating in today's webinar.
and thank our extensive scientific community who has accompanied us in our journey to promoting innovative technologies to ensure precise and universal healthcare access. Now, if you are planning a study or project and would like some guidance, our team would be very happy to support you in any way that we can. Again, thank you everyone and have a lovely afternoon.